Welcome back, everybody. Eric here. All right, today I'm going to be reading an op-ed for you, and this one is a lot of fun. It is related to firearms, uh, but, you know, this is one of my articles, okay? I am writing on Substack now. I've got some, uh, you know, cool stuff coming through, some great op-eds, so check them out. You can subscribe to my Substack for free uh, down in the description box below. There's a link. You can become a paid subscriber if you wish. No pressure. You don't have to. If you want to support my writing, you can, or you can sign up for free. And uh, we're going to get into today's op-ed, and this is by yours truly. Normally, when I'm doing the 2A reads and things like that, I'm usually reading other people's articles. Uh, I don't really release a lot of writing of my own. So I decided to do some writing on my own, and for now, I'm publishing on Substack because I can self-publish. There's no editorial control. There's no censorship. Uh, this is a place I can say whatever the heck I want, any way I want, and I ain't got to worry about editors or anything like that. Uh, this is just me and my ideas. This one's called On Guns and Weed, and I hope you're ready for this. This isn't going to end the way you think it is. My position on this may not be what you think it is, but... Give me an opportunity here, and maybe we'll see eye to eye on this. And there is some humor in here, too, which is, you know, there's some serious notes and some, some lighthearted stuff, too. Okay. <clears throat> we probably need to have another look at Schedule 1. It's no mystery that my position on marijuana has been made clear. Over the period of time, I've been putting my thoughts and opinions out on Twitter and YouTube. The long-standing prohibitions on purchasing or even owning a gun if you're a user of marijuana are not a mystery to many, but are those prohibitions constitutionally solid? Do those prohibitions go all the way back to 1791 when the Second Amendment came to be? Should we be having another look at this? I think it's worth starting in alcohol, actually. A current poll on my Twitter page has 84.8% of respondents saying that alcohol ruins the most American lives compared to cigarettes, at 9.7%, uh, and marijuana at 5.5%. Like many young men in the South, I grew up around the belligerence of alcohol users, despite my best efforts to stay away from it. The same goes for cigarette smokers. I can probably speak for many people when I say I've witnessed more fights and acts of stupidity from those under the influence of alcohol by far than any other substance. The argument could certainly be made that it's only because you can go to any corner store and pick up alcohol usually seven days a week without any form of major regulation. Not that I am for giving the government more reasons to interfere with people's lives, but hopefully the point is understood. Alcohol ruins a lot of lives. This much is clear. Whether by drunk driving fatalities, overuse fatalities, or any other accidents or violence stemming from alcohol abuse, it's clear that many people have a drinking problem. Listen, before I go any further... I just want to reiterate real quick. I'm not here to say to be a nanny to anybody. Look, I quit drinking back in October. I haven't had a drop since October. And that was my decision to quit drinking. But look, if you drink, I got no problem with you. I'm not trying to say you're a bad person if you're a drinker. Just want to make that clear. Okay? I'm not here to nanny anyone. We are all adults. I made a decision to quit drinking and I am now nearly six months sober. Alcohol, when used in a social setting and in moderation, doesn't pose a lot of issues for most. I think it's worth noting that the bulk of society has had a really rough couple of years, and I'm sure that's attributing to the rise in alcohol abuse. So the picture I'm trying to paint here, y'all, obviously, is that and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reiterate a few things further here later on in the article, but what I'm trying to iterate, or reiterate is that alcohol is, is definitely far more... You, you, damaging to society than the marijuana could ever dream to be. And you guys even agree with me. New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, a recent Supreme Court case, has really changed the landscape for how lawmakers must view the Second Amendment when they are proposing regulations. In Bruin, Justice Thomas made it clear that modern firearms that didn't exist in 1791 should be dealt considerable scrutiny in the modern age. Firearms laws not firearms, but firearms laws that didn't exist in 1791. Without getting in the weeds, no pun intended, on potential upcoming Supreme Court cases related to the abuse of Chevron deference, let's just say that Justice Thomas is on a roll, and I'm here for it. Was that another pun? I digress. Okay, no more dad jokes. So what laws pertaining to gun ownership existed in 1791? Take a look at yourself here. Okay, so I, I actually, in my substacks, I link various um, pages and articles and things like that. 
what it went back to is the old school slave codes and all of the the early gun laws that were passed specifically against uh, blacks in, in, at the time. Okay, that's what I was making making a reference to at the link. It's pretty chilling just how elitist and racist gun laws really were even at the time of our nation's founding. Things have not been perfect for sure, and it's a shame to see such ideas codified into law in a country where all men are supposed to be equal. The point I'm making is in gun laws in 1791 don't say anything about the type of guns you could or could not own. They don't say anything about your state of mind or the substances you use. They did make a distinction about the color of your skin, and that's terrible. Justice Thomas rightly has a chip on his shoulder. Gun control as a giant social construct has always been to keep undesirables in society from having access to guns. It's terrible, and I disagree with it, but that's the landscape as it exists. Considering the poor treatment of a man like Justice Thomas by the mainstream media and academia, I think he's wanting some reckoning on this, and he will get it. Just wait until Cargill versus Garland goes to the Supreme Court. What does this have to do with marijuana? It's not hard to figure out why the marijuana question was added to the 4473. Why not alcohol? After all, it clearly ruins more lives and kills more Americans yearly than marijuana. Alcohol certainly impairs your judgment and makes you considerably, considerably more belligerent. They chose marijuana because of pressure from pharmaceutical lobbyists, for one. And secondly, because in 1968, the Nixon administration had it out for people of color in the war on drugs that was firing up. The government hated the anti-war left, they hated people of color, and the new gun form was one more way for them to target who they viewed as the most frequent users of marijuana. Obviously, there were tons of crazy things going on in society, including riots, looting, crime, as well as some high-profile murders and assassinations. Around 80% of Americans went along with the idea for more strict gun control laws at the time. I still go back to race, though. Most cops back then were very sympathetic to average white people and, of course, had extreme bias against people of color. I think most average Americans viewed this as a necessary evil to keep the people they viewed as troublemakers from being able to obtain a gun easily. They knew they could lie on the form without consequence. They knew that the police would never question them about their guns in any way unless they were actually committing a crime. I would argue that this is precisely how law enforcement should handle guns now. If you're not hurting someone or committing a crime, it doesn't matter what guns you have. And just to be clear, I'm not I'm not implying in that statement there um, that I that I support you know the profiling aspect of it. I'm just saying that you know guns should just be treated as a tool, and that it shouldn't matter who has what gun. If you're not committing a crime, it's nobody's business what gun you have. That was the point I was trying to make, and if I failed to articulate that, I apologize. It's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. The tides are already turning in a considerable way on marijuana prohibitions being in conflict with the Second Amendment. And there's an article that I'll pin below if you want to check it out related to what I'm talking about there. Some VA clinics are beginning to do preliminary research on psilocybin as a means to treat depression, PTSD, and other behavioral disorders. It is my hope that our laws will come to terms with our vastly superior knowledge of these compounds compared to the 1960s. The government also feared the cultural revolution that LSD and other psychedelics were causing at the time. 1968 proved to be a pivotal, pivotal sorry, year for big government to flex their muscles on free thinkers. History repeats itself, but we can only hope that the critical thinkers of our society can stop these wrongs from being repeated. We are on the horizon of a new breed of philosophers and thinkers who use what nature provides to rid themselves of the need of big pharma's pills. So again, in my writing, I try my best to, I pose the question and I allow the reader to come to their own conclusion. I try to lay out what I feel are the pertinent ideas in my mind and my convictions and what they are and I allow the reader to draw their own conclusions. I feel very strongly in that. I don't really want to be too preachy. I try not to be too preachy, but I try to view the landscape for what it is. And, you know, again, I'm not trying to white knight here. I'm not trying to be a knight in shining armor and saying, oh, I'm trying to be some woke champion of, of people that aren't like me. But the truth of the matter is, is that if we're going to be truthful with each other and honest with each other as a society, and we're going to come together and come up with meaningful solutions to our problems together as a family, as a community, 
you know, you can't expect a transgression that's been carried out against someone to be ignored. You can acknowledge it and you can say, yes, that existed. Yes, that happened. Yes, these people were treated this way. And I think that's at least an important first step to just say, hey, you know, things weren't always perfect, right? There were times in our past where we abused uh, the, the systems in place to benefit ourselves and ultimately hurt our fellow Americans. We have to avoid these things from happening in the future. Right now, there are Americans locked up in prison like animals over a plant. Listen, I have no dog in this fight. I am not a marijuana user. I don't care about marijuana. I really don't. But I'm just a logical person. I'm a factual person. I'm a person that values personal freedom and personal choice. I'm a person that... You know, you know, unless someone is being victimized or hurt or physically harmed or their liberty or freedom is being taken from them, it shouldn't be the government's place to be a gatekeeper to, to what freedoms you choose to engage in or what substances you choose to engage in. And that's probably an unpopular opinion amongst many conservatives. I'm not going to lie. It sure is. Yes, I'm a conservative. OK, but I'm probably more centralist than people would ever imagine. You look at me on the channel and I'm running guns all the time and you think, well, he's a machine gun dude. and He's got suppressors. Well, he, he must be some crazy right wing redneck weirdo. But, but that's just, I mean, look, I got no problem. People are going to be what they're going to be. But for me, I try to always approach every situation with nuance and care and, and respect and logic. Is that not what everybody does? Apparently not. I mean, I think it's it's terrible to lock someone up for a plant. I certainly do, especially when alcohol's prevalent and it's out there and people get drunk and do all kinds of stupid things. That's completely legal, right? The 4473, you could walk into a gun store drunk as a skunk and buy a gun. And technically, they really have no legal reason to not sell you a firearm. Now, personally, I mean... I'd probably be like, look, buddy, come back tomorrow, okay? Or, you know, you, you need to sleep on this and, and come back or whatever. But ultimately, if someone can pass a background check and they're not lying on the form, you know, it makes no distinction about alcohol use. Not even your current state of mind as you're in there filling out the form. You could be burping up freaking uh, margaritas while you do it. And look, I got no problem with somebody that drinks. Look, I, I drank a lot, okay, in my younger years. But I've, I've chosen to have... Uh, a better, you know, mode of health moving forward. I've tried to take my health seriously and eat right and, and get my physical fitness right, you know, and part of that involves me quitting drinking. Again, not here to judge. If you drink, you drink. I've got no problem with that. I love I love to drink. Uh, I, sometimes I still want a little sip here and there, but I, I abstain. I choose not to. Um, everything in moderation, as they say. So, again, I'm not here to paint alcohol users with a negative light. However... Um, I just find it to be very odd that somehow the use of marijuana is somehow specially given that type of treatment, even over alcohol, on the 4473. So it's like the choice is either add alcohol to the 4473 or remove marijuana from the 4473. You go back to 1791. Again, I pose the question, find me a law in 1791. Right. When the, Const when, when the Second Amendment w was found was adopted, find me a law in 1791 that said you couldn't be on the devil's lettuce or that you couldn't have a beer in you. You can't. It didn't exist. Now, there is one situation where I think it, it was none other than even, um, it might have even been James Madison himself who wrote the innkeeper back and was like, hey, I left a pair of pistols in your parlor at the bar. Um, could you secure those for me? You know, and now, does that mean that he gave the uh, innkeeper his pistols to hold on to while he was traveling so they wouldn't get lost or because he was going to be drinking that afternoon? Who knows? But the point is, uh, it was well known that people traveled with firearms at the time and that road guns were perfectly normal, that it was normal to check into your inn to have a beer and have your pistols, you know, on your person or at least in, in, in tow. So... I think that Bruin does change the landscape. And again, the question I pose in this uh, op-ed is if Bruin changes the landscape in a way that if the firearms provisions 
uh, that exists now, including the marijuana question on the 4473, uh, is that in line with the tradition and historical concept of the Second Amendment in 1791? And that answer, absolutely, is just no. Again, I have no dog in this fight. I don't care about marijuana. I don't use it. Whatever, right? You want to use it, do you. The point is, I'm all about logical consistency, though, right? If we're being logically consistent, if we're being morally consistent, if we really do think that it's appropriate to lock a person up like an animal over a plant, I just don't, I just don't see that as being something a, a developed Western modern nation should do to people where we live in a country where freedom, personal freedom is supposed to be at the entire cornerstone of how we operate as a society. Just something to think about. I hope you'll, maybe I change your mind a little bit, but again, I'm not necessarily trying to, you know, plant some idea in your mind. Uh, I guess that was another pun. I'm sorry, uh, but, but it was. Another dad joke, if you will. I'm not trying to plant some crazy idea in your mind or, or, or try to get you to necessarily think my way on this. I'm just trying to get you to think towards the, the way of logic. And, you know, I just don't think it's logically consistent. It's definitely not constitutionally consistent. And I think we're going to see some pushback on marijuana prohibitions on the 4473. And we're going to see some pushback on Title I, or Schedule One rather, I'm sorry, uh, when it comes to psilocybin and psychedelic research. Time will tell. So I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for tuning in. Many more on the way. And make sure that you subscribe to our Substack. And a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. You guys are amazing. Also, go over to Ballistic Inc. and pick yourself up a new t-shirt. That's one way you can support our efforts if you wish to do so. Also, follow me on Twitter at IraqVeteran8888. Hope you all have a great day. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you soon.